Andrea. Yes, amen. So um, we appreciate that. Please find, take your Bible and find the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. This morning we're going to be in verses 23 through 28. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 through 28. When you find that, if you wouldn't mind standing with me that we might honor God and his word this morning. Also so that I know that we're all there and we're ready to breathe. And also so that I know that everyone is awake. Right? Matthew chapter uh, 23. But if you fell asleep during that music, there might be something wrong with you. Matthew 23, 23 through 28, beginning of verse 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the, omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones. And of all uncleanness, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we give this time to you uh, for instruction in the word. Bless us now through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. Now this morning, through the word of God, through the teaching of our Lord and Savior, our Lord Jesus, we are going to approach the subject of hypocrites in the church. Are there hypocrites in the church just as uh, many claim that uh, there are? Are there hypocrites in the church? And the answer is most assuredly yes. Among those who attend church, even those who are members of the church, there are people whose hearts are not true to the Lord Jesus. There are people who sit in church week in and week out and their heart has never been knit to the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit. I want you to take note Listen, Judas was a disciple. Judas was one of the twelve. He was part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, more than likely, he was one of the 70 that the Lord sent out two by two. One of the 70 who came back proclaiming the glories that they had seen, that demons had been cast out at their word, that the sick had been healed. Judas, who sat at the Lord's feet for better than three years was nothing more than a hypocrite. He was a phony. He was a fake. His heart was never truly knit to the Lord Jesus. And that happens in the church today. There are people who will connect themselves to the church, become a part of the church in name only, but they are not the church. They are not the ecclesia, which means the called out ones of God. My dad said they just come to church to warm themselves on someone else's fire. And Jude's letter at the end of the New Testament, Jude's letter in verses 10 and, uh, through 12, it, it describes the hypocrites in the church in some detail. Verse 10 says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally, that is what they know from a worldly perspective, as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. These hypocrites, these phony Christians, I like what Adrian Rogers calls them. He calls them cardboard Christians. These cardboard Christians don't have any real spiritual understanding about anything. And so they'll always speak evil of spiritual truth. They'll call real Bible teaching, they'll always call real Bible teaching into question. Everything that they know, everything they understand, it's according to the world. Not according to the Holy Spirit, not according to the Word. And in this, they are corrupt. Listen, when they're not at church, they're just like the world. When they're not at church, they're just like the world. Uh, when they're not at church, uh, when they are at church, they'll act holy. They'll act pious. But when they're not at church, they'll simply reflect the world and everything that they do. And, and, and anything they try to say, anything they try to teach, or when they speak up or try to add something in the church... Uh, it will reflect the world. Everything they say always uh, comes from a worldly understanding and a worldly uh, perspective. That's what Jude says. 
So why are they at the church? I mean, if they're so enamored with the world, why do, they, why do hypocrites even make a pretense of being a Christian? Well, look at verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Excuse me, Jude verse 11 says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. They perished in the gainsaying, and is the rebellion of Korah. So Jude gives us three reasons why hypocrites are in the church. Number one, they've gone the way of Cain. That the way of Cain is the way of false religion. The way of Cain is to present works in an attempt to earn one's way into heaven. Uh, the way of Cain is to try to earn salvation through works. That's what Cain did. He presented the works of his hand as an offering to atone for his sin before God. And that's why God said that, he, uh, that his offering was unacceptable. And, and what was the end result of Cain's religion? What was the fruit of Cain's religion? He murdered his brother because of religion. And this spirit is alive and well. This spirit is alive and well today in the false religions of the world that are trying to earn their place in heaven, trying to atone for their sins through their works. And they stand opposed to the truth, and they're offended by the truth. And so uh, uh, being opposed to the truth, you know what they do? They make martyrs out of Christians. Just like Cain did to Abel. What was the error of Balaam? Balaam was that prophet who was hired by Balak, the king of Boab, to go out and curse Israel. Balaam was a man of God. The Bible says that he was a man of God, but he was a man of God who could be bought. Listen, Balaam was a prophet for hire. He was only in the ministry for money. And there are hypocrites who uh, join the church because they want to profit from the church. They want to profit from God's people. Um, now listen, these are the people that I call car dealer Christians. Car dealer Christians. They're like some used car salesman. They're willing to stoop to any low to make a deal. Such as joining the church to increase their customer base. Or joining the church to try to increase their profit margin. They drop the name of Jesus at every point. They drop the name of Jesus in their TV commercial. Hey, come on down to Holy Ghost Motors where Jesus saves you money. Get the idea? I'm talking about false prophets. I'm talking about prophets spelled P-R-O-F-I-T. That's why they're in the church, for profit. And then there are those like Korah. Korah led a rebellion against Moses, the rightful leader of Israel, God's appointed man over Israel. He wanted to be the man in charge. Korah wanted to be the man in charge. He coveted power. He coveted authority. And there are people who join with the church, join themselves to the church simply because they want to be that big fish in the small pond. They want to be the man in charge. They want to be large and in charge. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the leadership in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, who handed him over for envy's sake. That's what the Bible says. And, and at the beginning of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus identifies them as men who would bind up heavy burdens upon others, but will not lift one finger to help. Matthew 23, verse 5, but all their works they do to be seen of men. And in verse 6, Jesus says, And they loved the uppermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the greetings in the markets, and to be called to men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Everything they do, it's all for show. It's all for show. It's all a facade. They love the honor. They desire the prestige. They want the glory that right, rightfully belongs to God. Listen, these are Pharisees and Sadducees who stood opposed to the Son of God. They desire the, the glory that belonged to God. They coveted it for themselves. They coveted the glory that belonged to God alone. So much so, they took the Son of God and nailed Him to a cross. They want glory. They want to be gloried over. That's why they desire the best seat at the banquet. The uppermost place at the fellowship meal. They want to be identified by people out in public. They want to be famous. They want to be recognized. They want to be gloried over. Oh, that preacher, he's so wonderful. Jude 12 says, these are spots. These are blemishes. These are tumors in your feast of charity. 
and they feast with you without and feed themselves without fear. I like this description. He says, clouds they are without water, carried about by the winds. Trees whose fruit withers without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You know what that is? That's Jude's way of saying, listen, these people are worthless. I don't think that's right that the preacher would say that anybody's worthless in this world. We'll get over it because there are worthless people in this world. They are no benefit to God whatsoever. They're no benefit to the church at all. They're no benefit to you or me. They're no benefit to the ministry. They live their lives for themselves. They are clouds without water. We are surrounded by agriculture. And everybody here knows what a cloud without water is. It's something that promises much but delivers nothing. Like when you're in the middle of a drought and you see this big old dark gray black clouds start rolling in. The wind picks up a little bit. You can smell the rain on the air, right? And yet that cloud just passes over and never releases a drop. It's worthless. It promises everything but delivers nothing. That's what the Bible says hypocrites in the church are. Hypocrites in the church are trees without fruit. A fruit tree that never produces any fruit is worthless. It doesn't benefit anyone in any way, except maybe to warm yourself in the wintertime when you toss it into the fire. And it's important to recognize, uh, recognize these things because, listen, there are times people get upset and, and, and they leave the church. Some hypocrite will get mad because they're not getting the attention they want. They're not getting the recognition they want. They get mad because no one's making a fuss over them or about them. And so, you know, they'll get up and they'll say very boldly to anyone who will listen, listen, I'm so offended, I, I'm leaving this church. I just can't take it anymore. They come to me and say, preacher, I just can't take it anymore. I'm leaving this church. I'm moving my membership. And then they'll say something like, well, can I ask you what the problem is? And, and you know what they'll say? Well, I just don't get anything out of the worship here. Well, here's a news flash. We're not here to worship you. Amen. We're not here to worship you. If you think that worship is all about you and what you need and what you want, this might have something to do with why you're not getting anything. Because this is for Jesus Christ. Why we're here today is for Jesus Christ. We're here to honor God, uh, to glory over God, to worship God. And if you want something out of the worship service, get your heart right. Start worshiping God. Amen. I just don't get anything out of church anymore, Pastor. The offense is just too great. I'm leaving. And then someone... This is when the worry parade starts. Someone comes to me and says, Pastor, so-and-so is leaving. What are we going to do? You know, I served with a deacon who got upset with me because I said in the sermon basically what I'm saying today. If you're at church for any reason other than you love the Lord Jesus, other than that you want to serve him and worship him, that, 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 that you want to grow as close to Jesus as you can, uh, if you're here for any other reason than the Lord Jesus, you're here for the wrong reason. And if you'd rather be somewhere else, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Amen. I preached that. He showed up at my office before I got there, and I get there early. Sitting in my office waiting for me. I need to talk to you, preacher. You, saw, you said something in your sermon I don't like. You told people if they didn't want to be at church, then they didn't really have to be there. And I said, well, that's the truth. So we need those people. So preacher, we need those people. And if that describes how you feel, I've got news for you. God doesn't need anyone. Amen. Listen, God was God before we got here. He's going to be God long after we're gone. He doesn't need us, not one little bit. Did you think that God suddenly appeared when we were created? He's been here throughout all eternity past, and he'll be here throughout all eternity future. Amen. John the Baptist said that God can raise up followers from the very rocks of the ground. God doesn't need anyone. 
The Lord Jesus, listen, don't, don't fall into this trap of thinking that Jesus is desperate for people to come and be followers of him. Jesus is not desperate for anything. He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. The Lord Jesus is not desperate for followers. The church certainly doesn't need hypocrites. Clouds without water. Trees without fruit. They don't add anything to us. Let them leave! Well, preacher, that's no way to build a church. I know right now someone might be thinking, wheels are turning. You know, preacher, if you start preaching like that, I mean, if you, if you have the audacity to challenge the hypocrites in the church, you're going to start driving people off. There's not going to be anyone left. And, and if you're thinking like that, it makes me wonder, do you think that we have an entire church full of hypocrites who are going to be offended by preaching about hypocrisy? If you keep preaching this way, you're just going to drive everybody off. I guess they think that everybody in the church is a hypocrite just like they are. The only people who get offended when you preach on hypocrisy are the hypocrites. And if you're sitting there offended right now, take note. The brother I spoke of a moment ago said the same thing as he was scolding me for challenging people and their pretentiousness. You know what he said? I hate this saying, by the way, so don't say it to me. Well, you know, preacher, you're going to get more flies with sugar than you do with vinegar. How many of you heard that? <laughs> I'll tell you something. We're not trying to draw flies. The Bible says flies make the perfume stink. Amen. Ecclesiastes 10.1. We're not trying to draw flies. Amen. We're here to preach Jesus Amen. so he can save souls. Amen. The church where all this happened... Uh, when I was called as their pastor, it had about 50 in regular attendance. And believe me, if you don't think 50 is a lot, it is. <laughs> you just try being responsible for 50 and see how much it is. Every day, new faces come in here and I go, oh. it's a lot of people in here this morning. That church where all this happened, we had about 50. I didn't do anything different there than, I'm, uh, than what God has me doing right here. Um, I set my heart to be a good pastor. Well, that's my goal, to be a good pastor in this church, to preach the word of God. Amen. Amen. And this brother was worried that I was running off church members because I, I was preaching the word, the same as I'm doing this morning. And there were people who were getting upset, and they were leaving. People got upset. They complained. And, and, and it always seemed like it, the complaint always came back to something that was said from the pulpit, which tells me a lot. The last Sunday that I preached there before I was fired, before I was voted out, yes, I got fired. The last Sunday, the last Sunday there were over 100 people sitting in that worship service. Over 100. I was the pastor of that church from June of 1999 to October of 1999. Uh, just shy of five months that I was there. And in that time, that church doubled in attendance. Not because of me, folks, but because the Holy Spirit was moving. Amen. Okay? Every week, week in and week out, there were people, new people, new faces, new people coming, and, and they were getting saved. And, and it seemed like every week we were baptizing new people who were professing faith in Jesus Christ. And, and the point is, listen, preaching the gospel didn't drive off believers. Preaching the Bible draws believers to the church. Preaching the Bible will draw genuine believers into the church. I like what Watchman Nee says about this. We learned this in men's Bible study on, uh, on Monday night. He said, people who are thirsty after the Lord, if we're preaching the Bible, if we're living uh, for God the way that we're called to, if we're living and walking, being led by the Holy Spirit, people who are thirsty after the Lord, they're going to come here. They're going to come to us because they want Jesus. They don't want hypocrisy. Get enough of that in the world, right? Amen. They want Jesus. Speaking of hypocrites, I just have to tell you this. My dad, he was, you know, he could turn a phrase better than any man uh, that, that, that I've ever known. And uh, somebody would come up to him and they'd say, Preacher, you know, I would come to your church, but there's too many hypocrites in the church. And he'd say, well, one more won't matter. You ought to come on. <laughs> <laughs> or another one he would do, he would say, well, there's, there's hypocrites at your job. Does that keep you from going to work? 
Listen, preaching the Bible doesn't drive off believers. It draws them. People who are thirsty for the Lord Jesus will come here if God is being honored. You can't drive off Christians by preaching the word of God. Amen. You can't drive off Christians by preaching the word of God. You're only going to drive off the hypocrites. <laughs> and I stated plainly when I first arrived on the field here, I intend to preach the Bible. Amen. I intend to preach the Bible to the degree that if you are living in sin, you're not going to be able to sit under this preaching. That's the goal, folks. Preaching that drives believers closer to Christ. Preaching that drives sinners under conviction of the Holy Spirit so that they will repent, call on Jesus and be saved. And preaching that's going to drive the hypocrites to the hills. Amen. That's the goal. Hypocrites, they're of no benefit to the church. They're clouds without rain. They're trees without fruit. And they're nothing more than blind guides. That's what Jesus calls them in verse 24. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That means that hypocrites will always make a big deal out of little things and overlook all the big things. Strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. They tied mint and anise and cumin, and they overlooked the weightier matters, matters of the law. What does it say in verse 23? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. Now, according to the Mosaic law, all produce, all produce was to be tithed. And so these Pharisees and these Sadducees, they would tithe even the herbs from their garden. That's what Jesus is pointing out. You are very, very um, attentive to tithing even the herbs of your garden. They were very careful to observe even the smallest matters and to the minutest of details, but they had completely overlooked the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and grace. And the hypocrites today are the very same. They are graceless. They are without mercy. Oh, they make mountains out of molehills. They're the, they're the very first who will call out others for what they feel are an infraction of their own religious code. And they know the church bylaws, they know those bylaws inside and out. Can quote the Constitution, but can't quote the Bible. First to sing out when the business meeting doesn't go according to Robert's rules of order. Worried about dress code. Worried about things that really don't matter. And yet, when it comes to showing grace, or showing mercy, or exercising some compassion, they're silent. My dad, you know, he used to call, he used to call these people in the church the church police. Church police, they're here to execute the bylaw. The Lord Jesus says in verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. That is, self-indulgence. Inside, Outside you look all clean and holy, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. And they've never let down their guard in public, believe me. Never let down their guard in public. Always keep up the facade. The outside is squeaky clean. But the inside is filth. That's not me talking. That's Jesus. What does Jesus say? They're filled with extortion and self-indulgence. A hypocrite's heart is filled with extortion. The Greek word here translated extortion is harpage. And it means to seize upon something by force or robbery or plunder. And, and the word extortion here uh, in the King James Version, it really is a good descriptor of what was residing in these Pharisees and Sadducees' hearts. Because to practice extortion is to get money or get goods by threats of violence or, or through the misuse of authority, you see. And so this word extortion really uh, fits here. I mean, through choosing to translate this word extortion, it could be that the uh, King James Version translators, they wanted the reader to understand the true nature of Pharisees, the true nature uh, of the Sadducees, and in this also, the true nature of the hypocrite. Abusing authority in order to get gain. 
Misusing authority to plunder the church. Misusing authority to plunder the believers. To rob the church. Not just of material goods, but also to rob the church's souls. Remember what Jesus said. They would traverse heaven and earth to make one proselyte. And then when they win one, he is twice the son of the devil as they are. On the outside, they look so very pious and holy and they can, they can talk the talk, believe me, but they don't walk the walk. They are, in fact, misusing their authority. They are actually presuming authority in the church they don't really have because God has not given them authority. They're using this to extort money from the church. They're using this to extort goods from the church. They're using this to uh, practice extortion in the church. And, and really, I'm reading this, and, and it all sounds very familiar to me. Uh, preachers who want people to see them as holy men, and yet at every turn, uh, all they're trying to do is get into others' pocketbooks. Sounds pretty familiar to me. Holy on the outside, filthy on the inside. Holy on the outside so that people will donate money to their ministry so they can, you know, go out and buy themselves a brand new jet. I need this for ministry. Really? Because there are plenty of commercial airlines if you have to fly somewhere. Men who preach and act holy when they're at church and then get caught in a motel with someone who's not their wife. Millions of dollars in their bank accounts and hookers in the motel rooms. And you know what they're doing? They're bringing a reproach on Christ. That means they're sullying the name of Christ. They're sullying the name of the church. They're bringing a reproach. And they open the door for unbelievers to honestly say, oh, these guys are only in it for the money. Well, these, these guys are no different than me. Why in the world would I want anything to do with that? <laughs> They're hypocrites. The Bible calls them sons of Belial. That means worthless. They're children of their father, the devil. On the outside, they may look clean, but on the inside, there is extortion and excess. And, and, you know, listen, if the inner man has not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, if the inner man has not been changed by the Holy Spirit of God, cleansed by the Word of God, if the inside's not clean, it doesn't matter how clean you are on the outside. You understand? If the inside's not clean, it doesn't matter how clean you look on the outside. Look at what the Lord says in verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee. Clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. I mean, if you want to be honestly be clean, you got to clean the inside first. You've got to let the Lord Jesus clean the inside, and then the out, he'll clean the outside as well. You'll be clean inside and out. That's the goal. Too many people, they want to wash the outside first. They want to wash up the outside first, which is to say they think they need to clean up their lives before they can come to church. They think they need to clean up their act before they can come to Jesus. They think that they've got to get straight before Jesus will save them. So they get the outside looking all pious and holy, and then they try to come to church and pretend like they've been living for Jesus their entire life. But really, honestly, everyone knows how they've been living. And this belief... You know, believing that you've got to clean up the outside before you can present yourself to Jesus, present yourself to the church, or be a member of the church. That's what leads to becoming a hypocrite, folks. If you clean the outside without having the inside cleansed, what happens is, listen, all you're doing is whitewashing the outside, and you're making it pretty on the outside, but the inside is still filled with nothing but dead men's bones. Verse 27, for your life unto whited sepulchres, Whited graves, which inside appear beautiful, but outwardly they are, uh, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Back in Jerusalem in the day when Jesus walked the earth, they had this habit of going out and pray, painting the graves white so that people would know where they are. Painting gravestones white so you would know where a grave was so you wouldn't inadvertently walk on a grave. On the outside, very beautiful, but on the inside, full of nothing but a dead man. One day, if you try to clean yourself up, and you kind of do clean yourself up, and you kind of clean up your act, and 
And you start coming to church regular and you're acting all pious and holy, but on the inside you're still that dead man, that dead woman. One day you'll be sitting in church. There you are just playing the hypocrite. You're going to look around and you're going to start to think, well, you know, this is exactly how all Christians are. When you're at church, you play the part. When you're at church, you play this game where you act holy and pious. But when you're not at church, well, then you can just live the way you really want to live. Correct me if I'm wrong. Someone who doesn't know Jesus, a sinner, still in his or her sins, and a religious hypocrite, Outside of the church, they're going to live that way because they think that's how everyone's living. And you know what? You can do what you want when no one is watching, right? That's why some, some people go to church regularly, will drive three counties over to go to the casino because they don't want people to know they're not really saved. I mean, that's the extent to which someone will go to, to play the hypocrite. And so when you're not at church, you willingly engage in sinfulness. Because you don't think anybody's watching. And I've got news for you. Someone's always watching. Amen. And what is more, you're wrong. Not everyone sitting in the church is playing games with God. That's just you. So identify. If you're playing those games, that isn't how the game is played. Because we're not playing games with God. Only you are. And the only one who's ever, who's, who's actually ever buying that is you. So the only one who's deceived is not the church, it's not God, it's you. And the one who's practicing that deception on you is you. Identify yourself. Amen. Well, I don't like to hear that, preacher. Neither do I, but I need it. Amen. Amen. Even so you outwardly, even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You don't clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. Listen, folks, Jesus cleans his fish after he catches them. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying in this verse, uh, in this section of Scripture. First clean the inside of the cup and the platter, that the outside may be clean also. See, when you come to Jesus, when you repent of your sins, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he's going to clean the inside, so you're going to be clean on the inside and the outside. Not some hypocritical way. You're going to honestly be clean. Inside and out. So if you're coming to church trying to be involved, trying to be a Christian, trying to play the part, but you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're not walking with Jesus, you don't have that personal relationship, please stop. Stop. Because I've got news for you. You're that hypocrite in the church that all those unbelievers are complaining about. Stop. Well, how can you know if you're playing the hypocrite? How do you live your life when you're not at church? What, do you, what kind of activities do you engage in when you're not at church? What kind of activities do you engage in when you're not around your Christian friends? What do you do when no one's around to see it or when you think no one is watching? Is your life constantly godly? Is it wholesome? Do you grab, gravitate to godly things? Or do you gravitate to sinful things? And for that matter, do you have your Christian friends and then you have your other friends and neither of them ever get together? Oh no, that would expose you for who you are. Is the only time that you don't engage in sinful behavior when you're at church or with your Christian friends? Think about it. Do you need someone to watch over you to keep you in line? If you need somebody to be on guard duty over you 24 hours a day to keep you from participating in any sinful activity, that reveals that your heart is bent on sin all the time. Even if you go to church, and you know you're sitting in church thinking about something you'd rather be doing that you shouldn't be doing. Your heart is bent on sin all the time. Even if you claim that you're a Christian, if your heart is bent on sin, if your heart is filled with sin, if you want to engage in sin all the time, it's safe to say that your heart is not filled with the Holy Spirit of God because Christ and sin are incompatible. Amen. 
He didn't go to the cross so that you can go out and sin all you want to. He went to the cross to deliver you from sin. And so if your life is filled with sin, it's safe to say you don't know Christ. Christians don't leap into sin and love it. They lapse into sin and loathe it. Amen. And that's how you know whether or not you're playing the hypocrite. What is your attitude towards sin? What is your attitude towards sin? You've got to have the inside of the cup clean before the outside will truly be clean. But you are never going to overcome that sin that inhabits your heart. Not on your own. You can't clean the inside. Only Christ can overcome that sin that inhabits your heart. Only Christ. And he'll do it. If you'll repent. And call on him in faith. Repentance means turning away from the world. Turning away from sin. So you've got to repent to be cleansed of sin. You've got to turn away from the world. You've got to turn away from the sinfulness of the world. And you've got to turn completely to Jesus by faith. And you've got to call on him and say, save me. Save me. That's the only way. To be cleansed inside and out. When you call on Jesus by faith, He's going he's to cleanse your heart of sin, and then the Holy Spirit's going to come in, take residence in your heart. Amen. You're going to become a whole new person. That's right. You're actually going to be that person that you've been pretending to be, for real. Amen. And then you're going to be eternally saved. Eternally saved and secure in Jesus. Amen. Clean inside and out. Anything else than Jesus, anything else than genuine faith in Jesus Christ, that's just playing the hypocrite. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, I pray for anyone right now who needs to make a decision for you. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would give them that ability to call on you by faith. Lord, I pray if anyone needs to make a decision, if anyone's been playing the hypocrite that right now, through the Holy Spirit, you bring them to the point of repentance and genuine faith in you so that they can know true cleansing inside and out. Now, just a minute before the band plays, I want to I, I want to give you the opportunity that if you don't know the Lord Jesus, that you might come to know him. That is, if you are sitting there right now and you want to be delivered from sin, you don't want to play the hypocrite anymore, you want to know what it means to live genuinely by faith in Jesus Christ. But you're not exactly certain how to go about it. I'm going to help you out this morning. What it takes is a prayer of faith. If you'll lift up a prayer of faith, it can be just as simple as saying, Lord.